is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Lyriel, chapters 41, 42, 43, 44, and epilogue. In these chapters, I can't believe that I didn't see this coming, you guys. I feel real, real dense. You know what it is? I just figured that the father didn't matter. I just figured that the father was some dude who cares. And that only the ladies mattered. Only the mommies mattered. I don't know why. I just completely discounted that the man had anything worthwhile of value to contribute. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Abby for commissioning this episode. Abby is here in the chat and just posted a laugh emoji. <laughs> um, yeah, you guys, I can't tell you how little thought I gave to who the father is. I could not have cared less. It didn't even enter my head that he mattered. It really didn't. Like, the only reason that I thought it might matter is simply because I figured maybe Lyriel would want to know and was going to like try and track him down at some point because I didn't think that he was going to be dead. I figured that he was still out there alive somewhere. Now, as it turns out, it seems that this was Lyriel's father or no, this was uh, Sabriel's father whom we met briefly at the beginning of the last book and then who wound up dying or at least staying in death, which is the same as dying. Um, so yeah, he's gone, but I just, I got to tell you guys never even entered my mind. <laughs> so I guess he knocked up Lyriel's mom while Sabriel was in school. Is that right? Which like, all right. I mean, far be it from me. If I, my dad was out here banging some chick with a one night stand, I guess I would not expect for him to tell me, you know, but I think it would have been nice if running into Sabriel in death and realizing that maybe his time was almost up. That since this lady was somewhat upfront with him about having to sleep with him just the one time, that he should have guessed a child was going to result and maybe should have warned Sabriel that like she had a sibling maybe out there somewhere. I don't know. Maybe Sabriel did know and just hasn't said shit about it because it doesn't matter right now so far as she knows. But yeah, so all right, that's how that went. Um, so yeah, he, he, this, this whole thing, it turns out is like, not that Lyriel is like a kind of an abhorson, which was a thousand percent what I thought. I figured, I didn't really think that she was ever going to get the site. I thought that her looking into the past was going to be her version of the site that had been inverted because of the blood of an abhorson being in her veins. I knew that, you know, based on her looks and the fact that she wasn't like everyone else in so many ways, it had to be abhorson blood. But I just figured it it resulted in a sort of strange version of the site rather than she just straight up would never get it. And like, that seems to be what the dog says to her also that like the looking into the past is kind of like the site as well. But obviously Lyriel only cares about the one type and it is blow when she realizes that she's just straight up never going to get it. Like, and as much as I have been very impatient with her in the past due to her seeming 
unmoved by the fact that she can do some shit nobody else can do, which I think makes her cooler and radder. But all she has wanted to do is to belong somewhere and to be like everybody else and to feel normal. And now all that's been proven is that she ain't. She not normal. She weird. And that seems to really like fuck her up. And... I'm somebody who tends to lean into my differences once I, once I zero in on what they are. I'm just kind of like, well, I guess I may as well do this real hard because that's how I am. I just like, I'm very extra in every aspect of my life. It's hard for me to understand still clinging to something like this, that really, even if she got the sight, at this point, it would still be strange. You know, she's 20. Like... I feel like it would it would take so much catching up and, and just joining with everybody at the age of 20 and going through the ceremony that girls are normally like 12 when they go through. It still would be so strange, but it's just something that she has been kind of obsessing over. Um, so it's a hard thing to let go of. And the fact that she had these little pan pipes that imitated the bells of course, I figured was just like her getting to access some of the abortion powers while not being given the full responsibility. And this recontextualizes what's been going on with poor Samoth, because every time that he wants to open the Book of the Dead or touch the bells, he has been overcome with this nausea and fear. And I have assumed all of that was just because of the effects of the trauma of running into Hedge and nearly getting killed. And now I'm wondering if that is an effect of somebody trying to mess with these things that doesn't have abortion abilities. Like, maybe that is just the way that this stuff warns off people who are not capable of wielding them. And I've been seeing the nausea as like something that he has to overcome somehow, something that he has to like... Basically, go to therapy and have a bit of a breakthrough and then he'll be able to touch them and use them. But maybe it's just supposed to be that he doesn't use them. I don't know. Um, that It's not meant for him. Um, Abby says, I personally think it's a bit of both in reality. It might be. Yeah. So honestly, this is a nice, like, I think that Samoth would agree, a nice revelation at least for him, where he gets kind of pardoned from having to deal with a lot of this. Um, now, that is not to say that it's not going to turn out he is meant to do something with death and he's just breathing a sigh of relief a little too soon and it's going to show up again later as something that he really needs to cope with. But for now, it just sort of seems like he's being pardoned completely from having to deal with this at all. And he is delighted. Like you couldn't, you couldn't have given him better news. Um, and it's so funny because I think, you know, if you didn't know what was going on with him, Lyriel showing up and being like, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm the person in waiting, not you, could really be seen as like a complete slap in the face. You know, it would, I, I wouldn't be surprised if people around Samoth, when they hear how this went down, might expect him to be really resentful and who knows? It might turn out that that is how he feels later. Once he started to like get past his initial fear, maybe if they wind up meeting up with Sabriel and she starts treating Lyriel a certain way, he may feel some sort of, of resentment. But, you know, the relief right now just completely outweighs everything else. And yeah. So, all right. Chapter 41 titled Free Magic and the Flesh of Swine. Ugh. Ugh, you guys, I just got the worst shiver. I hate it. There's so much basically body horror in this series that really freaks me out. Um, so they're still in the boat and they're being pursued by that galley. And the creatures on this thing like there's mostly humans but there are three or four free magic creatures on it the dogs winds up like shouting to them and thank god for the dog 
warning them because they had been kind of thinking that maybe they should just stop and explain who they are and that Samoth being royalty would be able to kind of just get his way, you know, but it turns out that there are, there are not only like a couple of, of creatures that seem to have been like taken over, but the captain of that boat actually is the, a, a, a full on construct um, has only the semblance of a man. It is a construct made from free magic and the flesh of swine. That odor I cannot mistake. Um, so that's really horrifying that we can just make it like this isn't charter magic the way that they make sendings because those you look at and usually it's like a just a sort of a cape with a hood and they don't have faces and you can see the, the charter marks moving around, creating what looks to be a solid object, but isn't. This is something that's like a full on illusion, which is so freaky that there are all these dudes in this boat taking this guy's orders, not seeing what he actually is like, dudes, what's what are you doing? You know what they need to do? Somebody needs to create a bunch of enchanted objects, like a bunch of enchanted eyeglasses. And they need to just hand those out standard to like soldiers and guards and stuff so that they can see through these kinds of weird illusions and glamours and, and things, because this is, this is crazy. It's, it's dead pig flesh enchanted to look like a dude. And they're all just listening to it. We need some full on they live style glasses to reveal shit. Um, so Samoth is uh, being assigned to steer and he's very worried about it, but it turns out Finder really does not need him. And this chase continues on for a minute. Um, and Mogget is just supremely unbothered. Like, y'all, Mogget is out here second guessing what the dog says, saying maybe we just need to let ourselves be captured because... I don't know. I'd like to be dry. I don't know about you. Moggett, buddy, what are you doing? What are you even doing, buddy? Like, he's sincerely suggesting maybe we just need to take a little bit of an arrow in order to not be uncomfortable. To which I'm like, you know how uncomfortable an arrow is, Moggett? I don't know what to tell you, buddy. So... Let's see. He says, there are two other constructs on board besides the captain, growled the dog, whose nose was still vigorously sampling the air. She was getting bigger, Sam noticed, and fiercer looking. Clearly, she expected a fight, discounting that, uh, discounting whatever Lyriel thought she was up, uh, she was doing up at the bow. So, question. How much can this dog transform herself? Like, can she create flippers? Like, let's just say something were to happen to find her and they all wound up being tossed into the water. Could the disreputable dog transform itself into maybe, let's say, a giant sea turtle that has a hard shell that everybody can pile onto and it can sort of stay near the surface and just swim with them on its back. Because I feel like that would be pretty dope. I want to see that a little bit. But I don't know. Maybe it's just mammals that she can do. Maybe that wouldn't work. What's a mammal that swims up near the surface real easily? Whales. It's a little too big. Depending on the whale. They tend to go up and down though. I'm not sure about riding one. How well that would go. Mm, maybe we could do something like a little exotic. Like well, we could do a polar bear. They sort of paddle. That could work. But anyway, I was kind of low key hoping for something like that to happen. But in the end, it's better because we need Finder. So Lyria winds up putting, finding the flag for the ship that has the sigil on it, this like kind of starburst. And in, immediately, uh, the others seem to get the message and realize the silver star of the Claire 
Um, there could be no doubt about whose boat this was, for the flag was not just a thing of cloth, but like Finder herself was imbued with charter magic. Even in the darkest night, the starry banner of the Clare would shine. In the bright day, it was almost blinding in its brilliance. They've stopped rowing, announced the dog cheerily. Um, but two archers are still going to shoot. Yes, no, the other four are overpowering them. The captain is shouting, it has revealed itself. So at this point, there's a fire that has broken out on the other ship. Um, in the middle of it, a column of white fire suddenly appeared with a whoosh loud enough to make the dog's ears crinkle back and to make the others flinch. The column roared up 12 feet or more. 12 feet, y'all. Like... That's two stories and change. That's fucking high. Then slid sideways and arced over the side. I would like to register my absolute disgust at the fact that this thing hits the water and bounces off it. I thought we were all in agreement that water was supposed to be the thing that was saving us. And yet here this thing goes, disrespect. Respectful. Just doing whatever it fucking feels like doing. No, 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 no. I don't like this at all. Not only that, but it goes up in a column of white fire, which high does that fucking ring any bells, guys? Because it does for me. I seem to remember a certain cat that looked that way when its collar was taken off. So... What, we've got another one of those fucking things running around out here looking like a damn... Mm -mm. No, sir. I don't, I don't like this at all. So, it's running at them in the shape of a fucking boar. I hate it. Soon, it was no longer a tall streak of white fire, but a gigantic burning boar complete with tusks. It ran after Finder in great splashing leaps, squealing as it ran, a sound that sent a wave of nausea through everyone who heard it. Sam was the first to react. He picked up Lyriel's bow and sent four arrows in quick succession into the thing that was fast catching up to them. All struck it head on, but they had no effect save for a sudden flurry of sparks. The arrows turned instantly into molten metal and ash. So Lyriel uses this spell that creates a golden net and it hits the boar and slows it down just enough that eventually it goes under and winds up being quenched by the water. But it's not like Samoth didn't know that spell. Apparently he did. He just didn't think that it would have worked against something that looked as strong as that thing does. And evidently why it worked is that it wasn't like the net itself harmed it. All it was was slowing it down. Um, Moggett says, while that kind of construct can move across running water, it is destroyed by total immersion. Slowing it for even a moment was enough. And... He says, so you see that this hound is not the only one who knows of such things. Now I really must have a little nap, which uh, Moggett just felt the need to be like, listen, the dog isn't the only one that y'all should be heeding, which feels pretty like on on brand. I think I'm not helping because I like really want to help so much, although I am bound to do so. I'm helping because I don't like the fact that y'all really clearly respect this dude a little bit more than you should. I mean, listen, I've said it so many times, especially in reference to like the Veronica Mars episodes. My pride is too great to do some of the things that Veronica does for the sake of getting information. Veronica lets people think that she's an idiot. Frequently. And she knows privately that she isn't and that she is one-upping them and getting info that will be their undoing. But that's not enough for me. I can't just be comfortable in the fact that I know I'm not an idiot. I need them to know also that I am not an idiot. I can't. There's episodes where the people who thought she was an idiot the whole time, they never find out that they fucked with the wrong one. 
you know, because they'll oftentimes be like side characters that she purposely makes kind of a fool of herself in front of. And she never goes back and is like, by the way, I know that you thought I was dumb, but really I was fucking you over. That doesn't happen. And I, it, it shouldn't matter what these randoms think, but I like want them to know that they got screwed by somebody who was smarter than them. I like, I need to know. This is like when people talk about how well, this serial killer is finally being sloppy because he wants to get caught because he wants everyone to know who did it. And people out there all over the world are just going, what? What are you, stupid? You want to go to jail? And I'm like, yeah, no, I get it. I get it, serial killer. You got away with it for so long that you low-key kind of want people to be impressed that you only ever got caught because you decided it was time to get caught. I'm not mad at you for that. I'm mad at the killing, sure. But the pride, I get it. So... Yeah, Margaret and I kind of have a little too much in common here. Um, so Lyriel is like thinking out loud about going to the Emporson's house and the fact that uh, they're going to finally be safe there, at least for a little while. Um, and he realizes like when she says that the island is just before a waterfall – that she's probably worried that they're just going to go right over the edge. And he tells her not to worry about it. He says there's a sort of channel behind the island where the current isn't as strong. It goes back almost a league. So as long as you enter it at the right point and stay in it, there's no problem. The wall makers made it. They built the house too. And it's brilliant work. The channel, I mean. I tried to make a model of it once using the waterfall and pools on the second terrace at home, the palace, but I couldn't make, I couldn't spell the current to split. And he stops talking because he realizes that Lyriel has totally tuned him out. And here comes this moment that I fucking love so much. I didn't realize I was that boring, he said with an annoyed smile. Sam wasn't used to pretty girls ignoring him. And Lyriel was pretty, he suddenly realized potentially even beautiful, he hadn't noticed before. Lyriel started, blinked, and said, Sorry, I'm not used to... People don't talk to me much back home. You know, you'd look a lot better without that scarf, said Sam. So? What? what what's your point, Sam? Are you serious? Y'all just got run down by a motherfucking boar on fire and you're over here trying to tell this bitch who saved your ass that she maybe would be cuter if she didn't wear a scarf that you don't like get fucked samoth i hate you what are you doing you idiot <sighs> i hated him so much this is the kind of thing that I think about when I was younger and the number of times dudes made comments like this and I really like listened and I wish so much that I could go back in time and grab myself by the chin and like force my young self into eye contact and be like, nobody cares and you shouldn't either. This little dicked child means nothing where would you fucking want? Like, I can't believe that he literally says that out loud. I really can't. I can't believe it. Like, it's one thing to be thinking to himself, like, wow, she's way prettier than I realized. And it's one thing to be thinking that at a time when it's not entirely appropriate. Like, we all have moments like this where we suddenly, like, see somebody in a way that we didn't. And it frequently happens during times that aren't appropriate because that's when we're, like, kind of on high alert, right? It's just stunning to me that he felt the need to say it out loud right now. And after having just like noticed that she isn't paying any attention to what he's saying about something that's like actually genuinely interesting, in my opinion, to think that that's a good thing to say next. Like, has she indicated that her your opinion on things matters to her at all? No. Why? Do you think this is something, oh my God, I just got so angry, you guys, I got so mad. I read that line over a couple times, just being like, I can't believe he fucking said this. Um, 
She really was attractive, though something about her face unsettled him. Where had he seen her? Perhaps she looked like one of the girls Elamir had forced on him back in Belisere. You know, you remind me of someone. I don't suppose I could have met one of your sisters or something, could I? Um, and he finally asks how old you are, or how old she is. Um, and she looks at him like, kind of like, why is he asking this? And then she sees the expression on his face and she's like, uh, and she pull, it says she looked away and pulled up her scarf, trying to think of something to say. Good for you. Good for you, sister. Just being like, oh, I get why you're asking. And then she basically, I don't know if you guys have seen that cartoon where it's a mermaid who's playing the harp and a sailor leans over his ship and goes, I don't like the thing that you are doing. Can you do another thing that I like? And the mermaid says, I will fucking increase the fucking thing. That's pretty much Lyriel right now. Oh, you don't like this scarf? And she like goes below and grabs like seven more scarves and just drapes them all over herself. And it's just like, that's a shame. <laughs> oh, God. Let's see. Abby says the only part that redeems this for me is that he's coming on to his aunt. That's true. That is ni a nice little like twist later on. Um, But oh, my God, this fucking cracks me up. And she's looking at him and she's just like, why did you have to do this? That's essentially what she's thinking. If only Sam could have just stayed like the dog, a comforting friend without the complication of romantic interest. There had to be something she could do to completely discourage him, short of throwing up or otherwise making herself totally unattractive. Yeah, there is something that you can do, Lyriel. There is, actually. There's telling him that you're related. Ah, perfection. But at this moment, like, Guys, how many times, how many times have ladies had this moment where we realize some dude is into us and we're just like, oh, fuck. It's not like there isn't a time in our lives where we really appreciate that we're attractive, that we appreciate that people are interested. Of course, you have moments where you're just like, it's nice to know I'm attractive. Like we need little boosts, right? But it's another thing when it's somebody that you like, you've kind of grown to trust and it changes the dynamic of your whole relationship once they realize that you're attractive and that they maybe want to bone you at some point. And it makes it so you can't trust anything that they do or say because they are constantly operating under this like misguided assumption that if they keep to good behavior, maybe they'll get to put it in at some point. And so it means everything that they say that seems like it could just be nice or them just being proud of you for being any like good at things or whatever. It all is laced with, yeah, but he's just saying that to get fucked though. Like, and that's the part that I think men don't understand about why, because so many guys try and act like, well, if everybody was always trying to have sex with me, I would just be flattered and delighted by it because women can have sex any time, but men have a hard time having sex because, you know, women get to be the ones who pick. And it's like, no, the thing is, you guys are seen as human beings first. That's what y'all don't get is that when we are being seen as a potential sex partner, that's sort of the end of the story for a lot of dudes. And y'all are seen as people and a lot of women decide who they want to sleep with based on what kind of person they are. A lot of men don't see women as full people, so they are not interested in whether or not they are smart or funny or even sane or fucking like competent mentally. Let's be honest. They just want to get their dick wet and we are just a hole. And that's frankly how an unfortunate number of men think. So dudes, if you want to really get an idea of what it's like for women who undergo this sort of like this being put on a shelf and being seen as a literal, when you say seen as an object, that is such a cliched phrase 
That is absolutely correct. But I, I feel like people don't understand truly what that means. We are not people. We are a checkbox that needs to be marked off. Like, frankly, it's a to-do list. And a lot of dudes, that's it. That's as far as it goes. So if you want to get an idea of what it's like for us and why we don't like every dude constantly trying to fuck us, the only other thing I can imagine is like, imagine, because this is the thing that guys always complain about, imagine if every woman you met was trying to get a look at your bank account all the time. This is the only comparison that I can make because guys are, for some reason, convinced that so many women are just after them for their money. You know what, guys? None of you are making money. Don't worry about it. Nobody cares. But let's say that's true. And that's what they use to determine whether or not they're going to fuck you. It's 100% just what your bank account says. And it's not about you at all. Imagine that. And suddenly, all of us wanting to sleep with you doesn't feel like so much of a compliment, does it? Because it's just determined on whether or not you have money. And that's kind of what it is with women. It's just, we just have a vagina. That's purely it. That's all it is. The fact that we have a vagina is the end of the fucking story. And it's just, it's just so exhausting. It's just so tiring. So that's the closest I can get to explaining how like dehumanizing it is after a point. And I'm not trying to say that Samoth doesn't respect Lyriel at all because he clearly does. But it's the fact that he went through this with her and he still manages to t try and tell her how to be more attractive after all of this. That to me betrays that he has less respect for her than he fucking should at this point, for sure. And it's almost as if his discovery that she is attractive, as if he fucking like him noticing is like the end all be all of whether it's true. That seems to have lowered his respect for her, if anything. And this is an infuriating thing that I think a lot of women have run into who are attractive. People assume that if you're attractive, you're also an idiot. And I'm not trying to say feel so sorry for the pretty girls because Pretty girls have an enormous amount of privilege that we don't realize we had until it's gone. But it is really gross to start to realize how much people underestimate you purely because of how you look. And that feels like what happens here. He suddenly sort of sits back and sees how pretty she is. And he's like, all of a sudden, giving her fucking fashion advice, like, he would not have done this at all. He would never have said anything to her. If it if he hadn't noticed her being pretty to begin with. So, again, it it's a dehumanizing factor. And there's a lot of of like reasons that I feel that I have put on weight in my life. But I really believe one of the reasons was testing out seeing what men would see past the fact that I was heavy to actually getting to know me as a person and realizing that I'm awesome. Because I started to realize so many men that I was dating really were like, they thought they were in love with me because I was pretty. They really did think that was like that their love was real. And looking back, I realized it wasn't. They were just like completely caught up in me being hot. And they didn't have experience enough to realize that this wasn't like a, a serious emotional reaction. And I kind of think that I like put weight on in order to filter out shitty dudes who weren't going to take the time to get to know who I was as a person. And it's just really gross to see that played out here. And I'm really curious because I know the author of these books is a man, whether he is like aware of exactly what's happening here or if he kind of stumbled on this, this situation by accident in his writing. And it just turned out to be exactly correct and something that a lot of women go through. I would love to know what led to him having this moment beyond just the fact that like, he knows that they are related, and he can't have them be drawn to one another. Because that's a weird thing to wind up having happen and then discover that she's his aunt just like a couple of chapters later. So 
I kind of feel like he wanted to put things in place to make it so that Lyria was not interested in him that way, so that it was one sided and easily quashed. And that might be the only reason, or he might have talked to women and heard a lot of them tell the same fucking story and was like, oh, okay, you know what? I'm going to include that. Who knows? But yeah, I spent too much time talking about this moment. But like, seriously, I just wish if there are any guys listening to this right now, just really think about the way that you look at women sometimes. Like, I'm not trying to say all men do this. And I'm not even trying to say that men who are guilty of this sometimes are guilty of it all the time. But it is a thing that especially younger girls who don't have the world experience to see it happening fall victim to men who are seeing them this way and they don't realize it until it's too late. Um, so once she realizes that she recognizes the expression on his face, she tells him that she's 35 and I love the despicable dog picks up and is just immediately like, oh, yeah, yep, no, like she's uh, she's ancient. She uses a ton of oils and creams and spells and stuff. But, uh, you know, she has to work to look this good. She's not just, you know, it's so great. Um, surreptitiously, he looked at Lyriel again, trying to see some lines he'd missed or something. But she really didn't look a day older than Elamir, and she certainly didn't act like a much older woman. She wasn't all that confident or outgoing for a start. Perhaps it was because she was a librarian, Sam thought, as he tried to make out what he thought was probably a very shapely form under the baggy waistcoat. Stop! Samoth, just don't do it, buddy, okay? Can you just not leer at her? while she's saving your life like is that so much to ask buddy what are you doing guy ah he makes me so angry ah, he's a clown um all right so they go to sleep and once they wake up they are pretty much almost at the abhorson's house um and Oh, wait, I forgot. Lyriel has to make a charter skin. That's right. Which takes like four hours. After that, they go to sleep. But she, Sam is like asking her all these questions as she's trying to do it. And she's getting really irritated and keeps trying to be nice, but also be firm with just like, you can watch me, but I need to focus. You can't be asking questions the whole time. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. No problem. And she's like, I know you're going to fucking do it anyway. And he does. He 100% does. Um Despite Sam and Lyriel's early, earlier weather spell, the wind had turned and was blowing strongly from the south. As Lyriel had expected, Sam hadn't been able to stop himself asking questions. But even with the interruptions, she had managed to create the charter skin of a barking owl and fold it up properly for later use. Um, and Sam is just like, I really want to learn how to do that. And she's like, yeah, well, I left the book back at the glacier, but like, I bet they'd let you have it. It's fine. Um, so... At this point, she says, the disreputable dog says, the sooner we're there, the better. There is a foul scent on the wind and the river is too deserted to be normal. Now, I should have seen it coming how bad things were going to get in terms of this dead, dead spread <laughs> reaching where they're at. But like, there's a fucking construct of, of, free magic and the flesh of swine on a boat with like at least three or four other creatures that are controlled by something all just straight up near this very crowded town. And it reveals itself and comes at them. No problem. I should have realized that shit had gotten pretty real and that if they are willing to, like, resort to open tactics like this, they are feeling pretty fucking confident about their position. You know, like, I should have realized, but I didn't. So when we come across this basically, like, massacre, I was really shocked at how bad it was and how, like, not only is it real bad, but it's like, there's no... As far as I can tell, there is no indication 
that any sort of protections have been laid anywhere in the vicinity. Like, I guess what I'm saying is that I expected for somebody somewhere with magic to have started to realize just how bad shit was getting and to begin to lay down some sorts of wards in places. And it seems like even if they had been doing that, this is happening kind of out in the middle of nowhere. So it probably wouldn't have helped. But the fact that it's kind of a free for all is really like upsetting. Um, so Sam says something about, you know, well, if the free magic is only uh, on the shore, then we can just sail past it. To which the dog says, I can smell people too, frightened people. And of course, this is low key, the dog being like, I mean, you could sail past, but you'd be a real asshole. Like, <laughs> there is something going on here. And I feel like we should probably do something about it. And at the same time, while I, I do feel like the dog was not in the wrong to say this, I, I feel I, they didn't really like accomplish anything. Part of me wishes the dog had kept her mouth shut, to be honest. Now, that's not fair because the dog does need them to realize just how bad the problem is. I say the dog needs them because I'm kind of operating on the assumption that the dog knows what's going on a little bit better than anybody else knows, except maybe Moggett, but even better than Moggett, I, I would hazard a guess. Um, so I kind of feel like what it is they're trying to do here, the dog being they, is let them know how bad it's gotten and how, like, what exactly they are fucking up against because Chlor of the mask is like apparently dead and has been transformed into this force that can just float around until it finds like another body or until it like finds somebody to create another construct for it. I'm not even clear how it, how it comes back, but it being killed the way that it is doesn't actually kill it or her. Um, so, yeah, I am really, I have very mixed feelings on the whole way this goes. I appreciate the fact that they managed to at least get out alive, but it's a really close thing and it depresses Lyriel so badly because they, like, she was hoping to at least save somebody and not a fucking soul survives. Like, there's this, this fucking creature that eats a child right in front of her and she's like about to throw up she's so fucking horrified and when they go back to the boat there had been a man who was running from this massacre and hits the river and swims for a bit and then just sort of floats and it's clear that he's still alive he's not floating because he just died he's floating because he ran out of energy and is just letting the river sort of take him so they're all thinking like all right, well, we can at least save that guy. He's in the river. He's away from it. But it turns out he got really, really injured before he hit the water and is bleeding out. And she could have healed him maybe with magic. But it turns out that this dude is a Southerner and he is somebody who doesn't know or understand about different types of magic. And he sees her about to use magic to heal him and like recoils from her screaming because the only magic that he has been exposed to is this evil shit that has killed everybody he knew and loved. So yeah, I mean, it's understandable why this guy is like, get the fuck away from me with that shit. Like I, I really get it, dude. I really do. But it's hard because poor Lyriel has to like, let his body go into the river and watch him float away and know they couldn't even save one person, not one single solitary soul. That's fucking brutal. Um, yeah, I felt really bad for her there. So they finally get to the Abhorsen's house. Um, and I had forgotten just how like sort of welcoming this place is. The last time that we came to the Abhorsen's home uh, was in Sabriel when she had just got done 
running from that fucking mordant, I think was the one. Um, and there is like a crew of undead that are like building a bridge out of graveyard dirt to try and get to her. So it's not really peaceful. It's not really like she can truly sit back and just sort of enjoy herself she just has to sort of figure out a way to fucking wash all of these people away and it's rough because she has to make this choice to do this and it's going to also like wash away some other towns and stuff like many people are going to get hurt um but she kind of has to do it so it's not a fun stay (laughs) and we get a description here that really like put me in mind of the fact that this is actually supposed to be like a peaceful, nice place. And it's a shame because they show up and they're already talking about how they can't stay. I mean, obviously Samoth is thinking that he is gonna anyway, but I was definitely sort of like understanding his feelings of just like, Oh my God, fucking really? Because yeah, I mean, he feels like he isn't going to be any help there. They sense the dead on the shore and he is given the option to pick up the bells and he doesn't take them. And he winds up just sort of plunging on ahead with just his sword. And like, apparently he's a pretty good fighter. It's not like he's totally ineffective, but once he winds up running into Claw of the mask, she's taking apart his spells on his sword. Like it's nothing. I mean, eventually the sword straight up breaks and he's got nothing to defend himself with. So I can understand in a lot of ways why he feels like, what am I going to go with you for? Like, that's not going to be effective. Thing is though, he can do magic. So even if you can't be an, an abhorson, you can be of assistance, dude. He's just really afraid and trying to make excuses for why him staying behind is perfectly reasonable. Um, so, they they go inside and the place is all painted white with like the red tile roof, which honestly sounds really pretty. And the door, the front door is painted like this very cheerful blue. And I was like, oh, this is so cute. And I had forgotten about how many of the charter sendings are like low-key senile because they're so old that they just like do shit really. Like I remember Sabriel and I remembered it right before uh, Lyriel goes up there. But Sabriel getting very forcibly washed and scrubbed by one of the charter sendings who, like, is not interested in anything that she wants at all. Um, But there's this moment I'm trying to find where it is. Oh, yeah, here it is. Um, I like it already, said Lyriel, smiling. There was the faint hint of a rainbow in the cloud arching over the white walls, framing the house with a border of many colors. Just as well, muttered Mogget, though you should be warned about the cooking. Cooking? asked the dog, licking her lips. What's wrong with it? Nothing, said Sam sternly. The sendings are very good cooks. Do you have sendings for servants? asked Lyriel. We do most of the work ourselves at the glacier. Everyone has to take turns, especially with the cooking, though there are some people who specialize. So... I don't remember about the cooking and it doesn't seem like they are at all saddened by it. I guess it was just Mogget being like a pain in the ass. And by saddened by it, I mean, when they sit down to dinner, it doesn't seem like anybody's looking at their plates like, oh, God, what is this? They're all very hungry and it smells good and they're excited to eat. Um, But yeah, this whole thing is just um, uh, leading up to. Lyriel realizing that the grand hall where they're about to eat is the place from the memory that she looked back on. Um, But we'll get to that real quick because first there is a message hawk that is trying to get through a barrier of gore crows. I was very anxious about this. I won't lie to you guys. I really was like, is this thing going to make it? Is it going to get killed? What kind of like important message is this? I was worried. It turns out the message isn't totally crucial. At least it didn't feel that way to me. It wasn't like somebody being like, they're heading for the abhorsen's house. If you're there, you need to get out quick. 
um, it manages to finally get through the gore crows and it says the message. I thought it would be carrying it like a raven, you know, but he says uh, with the voice of of um, what's her name? His sister. I forgot her name already. Elamir. But she says, Samoth, you idiot. I hope this finds you at the house. Um, yeah, Elamir. Father and mother are still in Ansel's chair. There is greater trouble than they feared. Coralini is definitely under the influence of someone from the old kingdom, and his Our Country Party grows more influential in the moot. More and more refugees are being moved nearer the wall. There are also reports of dead creatures all along the Ratterland's western shores. I'm calling up the trained bands and will be marching south to Baradin with them and the guard within two weeks to try and prevent any crossings. I don't know where you are, but Father says it's essential that you find Nicholas Sayre and return him to Ancestier at once, as Coralini claims we've kidnapped him to use as a hostage to influence the chief minister. Mother sends her love. I hope you can do something really useful for a change. So, uh, the voice suddenly stopped, having reached the limit of the message hawk's rather tiny mind. The bird made a, pe a peeping sound and started to preen itself. Um, and that's pretty, like, embarrassing, I feel like, to get this message from your sister and have her be like, I hope you don't act like a total fuck up as usual. But, you know, what are you going to do? Um, and he says something about how, uh, I guess we should talk about everything at dinner tonight. Dinner, exclaimed Lyriel. We'd better talk about it before then. It sounds like we should be off again straight away. But we only just got here. Yes, but there's the Sutherlings and your friend Nicholas is in danger. It may be that every hour counts particularly since whoever controls Clore and the other dead know we're here, growled the dog. We must move quickly before we are besieged. Sam didn't answer for a moment. Okay, he said. I'll meet you for lunch in an hour, and we can uh, work out what to do next. He stalked off ahead, his limp suddenly becoming noticeably worse, and pushed the front door open. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. But his limp suddenly becoming noticeably worse is a bit of a dig, right? Like he's just suddenly like, oh, my poor limp. This is really hard for me. Just trying to really like lean into the fact that he's hurt and being asked to continue on immediately is very trying and like kind of asking too much and whatever. Um, so Lyriel, uh, we have her coming after the bath. And let's see, Abby says, I'm never sure if it's that or if it's just an effect of realizing he's not really going to get a rest before they're off and in danger again. Yeah, I could see that. Um, so Lyriel wears her librarian outfit, even though she's been given a bunch of other much fancier clothes. And she's just kind of like, yeah, no, that's not me. I'm just going to wear this thing. And walks into the hall and suddenly is like, Oh my God. And I love this moment because I wasn't sure if she was going to tell him everything right away, even though she had realized it. And she finally flat out says like, I don't know how to say this, but so he's wearing this, um, surcoat, I think that's got, it's, it's been like divided and there's a, uh, a golden towers of the royal line, but they were quartered with a strange device she had never seen, some sort of trowel or spade in silver. It's the wallmaker's trowel, explained Sam, but they've all been gone for centuries, a thousand years at least. I say, I like your hair, he added, as Lirio continued to stare at him. She wasn't wearing her headscarf. Her black hair was brushed and shining, and the waistcoat didn't really hide her slender form. She really was very attractive, but something about her now struck him as rather forbidden. Who did she remind him of? So she beckoned to the sending that carried her surcoat. Lirial took it and unfolded it so that she could see the blazon. Um, are you all right? I don't know how to say this. And she undid her whisk and handed it to the sending. Sam started at her sudden undressing, but he was even more shocked when she put on her surcoat and slow, slowly smoothed it out. On the coat were the golden stars of the Clare quartered with the silver keys of the Ebhorsen. 
I must be half abhorson, said Lyriel, in a tone that indicated she hardly believed it herself. In fact, I think I'm your mother's half-sister. Your grandfather was my father. I mean, I'm your aunt. Half-aunt, sorry. So he asks, does she know? And Lyriel says, I don't think so. If she did, she would have come find me, right? Um, and of course, Sam is just like, this doesn't make any sense. If you're 35 years old, to which she finally has to be like, all right, I lied. I'm 19 years old. Um, how did the sendings know to give you that surcoat? I told them, said Moggett. How did you know? asked Sam. I have served the abhorsons for many centuries, said Moggett, preening, so I tend to know what's what. Once I realized that Sam was not the abhorson in waiting, I kept my eyes open for the real one to turn up, because the bells wouldn't have appeared unless her arrival was imminent. And I was here when Lyriel's mother came to see Tercial, that is, the former abhorson, so it was rather elementary. Lyriel was clearly both the former abhorson's daughter and the abhorson in waiting the bells were meant for. And at this point, Sam is like, wait, what? Are you serious? She's the one? Oh, my God. Thank the Lord. Um, he says, thank the charter. My bad. Um, and he says, you'll be way better at this than me anyway. Uh, all I managed to do going into death was get burnt and let him get Nicholas. And of course, she is still clinging to the fact that she's a daughter of the Claire. And like she is. But that's not all she is. She's a mix. Um, and then this is when she realizes that she will never have the sight. And the dog says no. And says, but it is your Claire heritage that gives you the gift of remembrance. For only a child of a porson and Claire can look into the past. You must grow in your own powers for yourself, for the kingdom and for the charter. So she keeps kind of like saying, I will never have the sight. And I really thought that she would cry, but she didn't. Um, and eventually Sam starts to just sort of babble. Bless him. Is it, is the sight really that important to you? You see, I feel amazingly relieved that I don't have to be the abhorson in waiting. I never wanted the sense of death or to go into any death or uh, into death or any of it. And when I did that time when the necromancer caught me, I wanted to die because then I thought it would be over. But I somehow got out and I knew I couldn't go into death again. It was just everyone else expecting me to follow in mother's footsteps because Elamir was so obviously going to be the queen. I thought maybe it was the same for you. You know, all the other Claire have the sight. So that's the only thing that matters, even if you don't want it. It would be the only way to meet their expectations. Only I didn't want to be what they wanted and you did. I'm babbling, aren't I? Sorry. Um, but yeah, at this point, Moggett's like, Moggett says, Lyriel is so obviously an abhorson that wanting the sight must be solely a peculiarity of her upbringing in that ridiculously cold mountain of theirs. So Basically, Moggett's just like, yeah, she's been conditioned to think that this is the thing she should want. But it's really obvious that that's not for her. So maybe she'll get over it. And she says that she wanted to belong. And Moggett's like, you clearly belong here. Look around. Everybody is like drawn to you. You feel at home in this place. Like the charter lights burn brighter above you than anywhere else. This whole house is welcoming you. You belong here. And she starts crying then at realizing that he's completely correct here. Um, and Sam gets really caught up in the fact that like, oh, wow, long lost family. We're going to throw so many parties. We're going to have some sort of like parade fucking. And then all of a sudden, Moggett has to be like, hey, buddy, slow your roll. We still have 200,000 potential undead to deal with. So maybe worry about parties a little bit later. Yeah, that's fair. Um, so let's see. Do, do, do. Oh, yeah, here it is. Um, shouldn't we send the message first to your parents and Elamir? We should, only I'm not sure what to say. Everything we have to, I suppose. Uh, she kept looking down at the silver keys on her surcoat and feeling dizzy and sort of sick. 
We need to make sure that Princess Elamir and your parents know what we know, particularly that Hedge is digging something best left buried, something of free magic. So Sam at this point says that he wants to stay behind and everybody is looking at him like, are you fucking high? And he admits how afraid he is and like kind of starts crying to which Lyriel is like, dude, fucking duh. I'm I'm scared, too. Are you kidding me? Like, what are you? I'm scared. I'm tired. I don't want to do this. Um. And he finally asks, do you think I'm a coward? And she says no. And I'm like, well, low key, Sam, I don't know. Maybe you are. But I, uh, you'll get over it, hopefully. So we go from this to a an epilogue, which starts off with the writing of a letter by Nicholas. And he explains everything to Sam. And it's all him thinking like the people that are working for him have some sort of like weird plague or leprosy because he doesn't realize that they're dead. It's all awful. Um, and he's talking about these two halves of this weird sphere that are buried here that he's trying to get up and then he will like bring into Ancestieri and he'll use them as like a power source for electricity. And I'm just like, yeah, that's not what that's going to be used for, but okay, buddy. Um, and then we get the end of the letter and he calls in Hedge to deliver it. And Hedge is like, oh yeah, yeah, I'll totally do that. No problem. And then all of a sudden, poor Nick, who has not been feeling well, uh, it says that his hair was falling out and his gums were sore, but it couldn't be scurvy for his diet was varied and he drank a glass of fresh lime juice every day. Finally, he sort of like gets taken over by this other source. Um, this other, I, I'm guessing one of the nine, right? Broke it, broken into and buried under hill forever to lie there wishing us ill. Um, and this thing begins to talk about how creation is running amok without the balance of destruction and so, but soon the world will fall asleep and it will be my dream that all will dream my song that will fill every year. And it says, destroy the letter, send more dead to Clore and make sure that they slay the prince for he must not come here. Walk in death yourself and keep watch for spy for the spying daughter of the Clare and kill her if she is seen again. Dig faster for I must be whole again. The last words were shouted with a force that threw Hedge against the rotting canvas of the tent to burst out into the night. Um, And poor Nick is like laying there completely unconscious and there's blood coming out of his nostrils. Oh, that sucks. Poor Nick. I feel so bad for him. He didn't ask for any of this. And he seems like a pretty good hearted young man. But there it is. Um, so yeah, so that's the end of Lyriel, guys. So the next one's Clariel, I think, right? Which, uh, is that what Lyriel's name is going to get changed to? Oh, it's not. Abby says no. Abhorson is the next one. Oh, okay. Because I think at the end of this, it says excerpt from Clarial. So I assumed that it was an excerpt from the very next book, but evidently not. Okay. Well, I didn't read it, so that's fine. Um. All right. Well, Abhorson's coming. Cool. Uh, all right. Thank you again, Abby, so much. Abby says, oh, sorry, I should have said. No, it's fine. Don't worry about it. It doesn't matter right now. But it will. I'm going to start it soon. Guys. This is fun. I like these books. Um, all right, Abby, thank you again for coming and hanging out with me and for uh, co commissioning all of these. And I'm very much looking forward to starting a portion. This is wild. All right, guys. See you soon. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.